I felt the Lord prompt me to do this, and uh, hopefully I won't get too emotional, but maybe someone can give me the Kleenexes there, but uh, if I do. But I just want to share a tribute to Dr. Charles Stanley. Um, he was my pastor for three years, and, and a lot of you probably re remember, some of them, not a lot of you, some of you remember me when I first came out of the lifestyle I was living of rebellion, and my life was a complete, total train wreck and mess. But raise your hand if you remember that. Probably, yeah, I'm just, okay, about 25%. Yeah, I was a mess. I was a total mess. And um, anyway, I, I just, uh, I, the first, I, I, I was going to school at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, and uh, a friend of mine, this is, I was talking to my friend Philip, and um, anyway, I'll just go go dogs if my eyes start sweating. But um, <clears throat> I, I, I was living, I'd, I'd got into the, I'll just say the party lifestyle for, for, you know, sophomore through senior year in high school. And when I got into college, I'll, but I was always convicted. I was a miserable sinner. I hated it, but I still was just doing it. And, but I just remember right when I was in college, I, I, uh, <clears throat> It was a, a guy there I met, Phil. He went, to high, he went to the same high school as I did. He was, uh, I think he was like Mr. SHS, and, you know, he was like this popular guy, football player. But he was a, he was a truly devoted follower of Christ. And I'd never seen anyone in school, to be honest, that truly, truly loved the Lord that was cool. Everyone that was a Christian was dorky and nerdy, and, you know, I was like, that, that was growing up, I was like, I don't want to... It just, it, you know, I needed some friends, I guess is what I'm saying. But so he, Philip was going to, to First Baptist Church of Atlanta, and so we started going there. And man, uh, I just, I just was thinking about it this week, <clears throat> how much uh, just Charles Stanley, his ministry, laid that foundation of the Word of God uh, in my life. I, I just was thinking, okay, I, I was thinking that. You know, I was thankful for the Baptist church, how much they laid the, the foundation of the Word of God. It's in the Word, it's in the Word, it's in the Word. And I was thinking, okay, the, the other church I went to, I don't think that, there was a great church, but I think because I was not really walking with the Lord then, I didn't receive any, I got saved there, but I didn't really receive that foundational thing. But it was going through Dr. Dr. Stanley's church of, it's the Word, it's in the Word, it's in the Word. Uh, just really, really, really impacted my life, and I'm just eternally grateful for his ministry. Um, I just remember, if you've ever seen Dr. Stanley preach, he I think he has the longest finger in the world, um, but his finger is like this long, and when he would preach, you know, I was, you know, a, a freshman in college, and when he would preach, he would be like, he would hold up his Bible, and he'd be like, my friend and his finger, I would sit in the balcony in the corner, He's like, my friend, and I felt like his fingers extended from the pulpit right into my heart and just convicted me like week after week after week. <clears throat> and, uh, and I just remember I was telling Angie, I, I used to, I used to, this is a scary thought, but I used to drive one of those white, big white vans that had delivered carpet and tile all over the metro Atlanta area. And I would, I would always, this is back when the, they didn't have the internet or any of that stuff, they didn't have CDs. But I would listen to Dr. Stanley tapes, uh, and he was, he was I, I got it from mom, and it was uh, on Romans, the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6, of being delivered from the, the law, delivered from the, the, the sin nature, crucified with Christ. And I, you know, just thinking about that, I didn't have a clue of any of that stuff, uh, but that teaching really even laid a foundation for a lot of the, some of the things we're, we're teaching here. And so... I also remember when we were in college, just we went to the college department and, and, the, and Charles Stanley spoke to, I think it was probably like two or 300 college students. And I have never seen anything quite like that, even to this day, of just the, the relationship that he had with God was profoundly impacting. And he lived the abiding life deeply. And uh, I just remember when he was talking to us as college kids, just the, you could just tell this man knows God and he exudes the life of God. And just when he would just share, I left that, that meeting going, I've never heard, I've never experienced something quite like that of a man who lived the abiding life. He, he lived that abiding life 
of living from the vine of the life of Jesus Christ, and it still impacts me to this day. So anyway, I just want to thank the Lord for his foundation in our life as he passed away last week at the age of 90. So anyway, I'm, I was really appreciate that. So anyway, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles now to, uh, to Romans chapter 5, verse 9. This is, this is part two of living living for God or living from God. And it's a very important question that we need to ask ourselves. Are we living for God or are we living from God? And so, Paul, I'm going to review just a little bit from last week, not a lot, but just a a little bit here of review is uh, Paul was talking and he says in Romans 5, 9 through 10, he says, much more than... Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So justification by faith is justification by faith, by grace through faith. Justification by grace alone through faith alone, apart from works, saves us from the penalty of hell. Thank God. It is not by works that we are saved. It is not by our obedience that we are saved. It is not by our performance that we are saved. We are saved because Jesus Christ, when we put our faith in him, imputes his righteousness to us and we are reckoned righteous and declared righteous, which is justification, and then we are saved from the penalty of hell, which our sins deserve. Praise God for that. That's only the beginning, though. And he goes on and he says, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, justification, I was talking about justification, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now this, a lot of times Christians make a big mistake in their interpretation because every time they see the word salvation, they immediately think salvation from hell go to heaven. Salvation from hell go to heaven. Almost, almost all is just universal But salvation is the word sozo, and it means deliverance. And so you've got to ask, deliverance from what? Is Paul talking about here, his life delivers us from hell? I don't think so. I think he's saying his life delivers us from the power of sin that is at work in our body. How many of you realize that we need need God to do a deep, deep deliverance in in our lives? And in this message, I'm not talking about being delivered from demons. So we do, if we are demonized, we need deliverance from demons if we are demonized. But I'm talking about in this message a deliverance that every one of us needs. And it it is a deliverance that runs so deep that it is like peeling the layers of an onion off one by one by one. And why, when you think you're, you got it, the Lord's like, you haven't even hardly started yet. There was another layer to peel off. And so Paul is saying is that we shall be saved. We shall be delivered. We shall be delivered by his life. See, not only, not only does, does, see, justification in Romans 3 through 5, justification delivers us from our sins, plural. Because Jesus, his blood, saves us from our sins, forgives us of our sins, justifies us, declares us righteous, and saves us from the penalty of our sins. In Romans 6 through 8, Paul is talking about He not only delivers us from our sins, he delivers us from our sin, the root of sin, the source of sin, which is your flesh. And so when when Paul says that we shall be saved by his life, we shall be delivered from the source of sin, the source of sin, which is your self-life, the source of sin, which is your flesh, your body, the sin at work in your body. And also what I'm going to talk about today, the lifestyle, the way of life that was embedded into our soul through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not only are we being delivered from the flesh, but we are also being delivered from the way of life embedded into us through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was really interesting this week where we had our prayer time on Wednesday 
And Drew was, was praying and he kept, he, at the, you know, after about 15 minutes of just, he shared this after about 15 minutes, I don't know if it's actually 15 minutes, after some minutes he was speaking and he said, I keep over and over, I keep hearing the word, to, I keep going back to the two trees in the garden, the two trees in the garden. And I said, well, that's really interesting because that's what I'm preaching on this Sunday. I was like, the Lord is highlighting that this is very, very important. And I really appreciate that word because what that word did was to highlight to me, and I wanted to highlight to us who are listening, how very important this message is that we would be delivered from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and how that affects us in living and that we might live by the tree of life. And I'll explain all that in this message, but I just want to set the context of how important this message really is in, in terms of what God is wanting to say to us, he wants to deliver us thoroughly from living by the tree of life that was embedded into the psyche, the soul of every human that has ever lived. And there's, if you really think about it, there's probably only a very small remnant throughout the world that are not living by the principle of this tree of, 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 tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which Watchman Nee called the principle of right and wrong. I'm going to explain what that means. But everyone, including most Christians, lives from the principle of right and wrong instead of the principle of life. And the Lord wants to deliver us not only from self, not only from sin, but also from the principle of right and wrong and to live by life. See, the abiding life hinges on obedience. You cannot be in a relationship with, and I'm, I'm not talking about going to heaven or hell here. I'm talking about in a, in a relationship of fellowship with God without obedience. Jesus said, if, Jesus said in John 15, 10, he said, if you, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Obedience is key to living the abiding life. This is not talking about where you go to heaven or hell. This is talking about being in fellowship with God. Obedience is key to the abiding life. And that we talked about this last week, that the New Testament commandments are actually far more exacting and far more difficult to obey than the old covenant commandments. Because Jesus is going directly to the heart that you must obey, obey not only externally, not only by behavior modification, not only by bodily restraint, but you must obey deeply from the heart and thought, motive and deed. That was his message on the Sermon on the Mount, is you have heard it said that the law says you should not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you even look at a woman to lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. You have heard that it was said that you shall not commit murder. But I say to you, if you have hate in your heart for your brother, you, have already, you are already a murderer in your heart. I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit. So the point is, the New Testament commandments are not easier. They are far more difficult. However, we now have his nature, his life, his power, his grace, his enablement so we can obey his commandments from the depth of our heart and not just externally through behavior modification. See, that's the difference between living under the law and living under grace. And so we talked all about that last, last Sunday. If you didn't hear that, I just want to encourage you to go back and listen to that message. But the, the main question that we have, we came down to is not, it, the in question is not whether obedience is important. Obedience is vital. The real question is, how will you obey under grace? Will you obey by living for God? Or will you obey by living from God? See, when you live for God, you exert all of your power in the soul to try to do good and be good, to try to avoid evil. Now, again, that's better than disobedience. But God wants to bring us into a much deeper way of, of obedience, which is obeying from his life, living from his life, not living for God, living from God. 
And so we talked about this. The fifth law of the Spirit-led life, which we're talking about today, is living for God begins, or, or sorry, say it this way, living by the Spirit, living by the Spirit begins when living for God ends. Living by the Spirit begins when living for God ends. And Paul discovered this through the, his battle with coveting, that coveting brought him down to his knees. And like a wise lifeguard, the Lord waited till he got to utter desperation and surrender. And he said, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And that's where Paul learned, he said, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. See, what happened was the commandment that came to Paul showed him and revealed to Paul that you can't live this life. You cannot live for God. No matter all, if you try to live by your own strength and power to obey him, you will fail miserably because there is sin in your body at work that always drags you down into sin. And it wasn't until Paul got to the end of himself that he said, thanks be to God, his life delivers me from the principle of sin at work in my body. Again, I'm punching my, myself. I don't know why I keep doing that. But anyway, so we talked all about that. And then Paul said in Romans 8, 4, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. See, the requirements of God's commandments do not go away. They always Remain. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, they go higher and deeper. But Paul's saying that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but who walk according to the Spirit. In the book of Galatians, Paul said that those who walk by the Spirit are not under the law. Because when you live by the Spirit, you will obey every commandment in the, in the law. Though I'm going to say every moral commandment, not the ceremony or the dietary or civil or any of those laws, but every moral commandment in the law, in the Torah, you will obey if you walk by the Spirit, if you live by the Spirit, if you live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, you will obey what God commands in his word. Okay, so we also talked about under grace, theologians call it synergism, which basically means, it's a big fancy word, that basically means in obedience and sanctification, God has a part and you have a part. God will not do, or God will not do your part and you cannot do God's part. There is a synergism in obedience that God has a part, you have a part. God will not do your part, you cannot do his part. And so the Spirit's role in obedience is to initiate, inspire, exhort, encourage, empower, and convict so that you will obey. Our role in obedience is to yield, to rely upon, and to live by the Spirit's empowering grace. Our role in obedience is then to, after we, as we receive the empowering grace, is to labor, to work, and to strive in obedience. Some people think that, no, we're, not, we're, saved, we're saved apart from works, therefore works aren't important. That's absolute, not true. I was going to say another word, but that would be nice. That's absolutely not true. Paul said, I labor more than all of you, but not I, but the grace of God with me. True obedience, truly living by the indwelling life, we will labor and work not by our own effort and strength, but by the grace and the empowerment of God to fully obey him. Paul said, I discipline my body and make it my slave so that I may not be disqualified from the high calling of God. Paraphrase there. So there is this place in obedience of striving and working and boxing and fighting and overcoming and making exerted effort to obey God and not please him. But it's not coming from a power that comes from you. It's coming from a power that comes from God. So there's synergism in obedience. There's synergism in obedience. So with that in mind, we're going to turn now to Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, because in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, 
the Galatians had this very same problem that we talked about last week. They were trying to live for God. And so Paul's writing, and you can just feel his, his frustration with him. Galatians chapter 1, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Verse 3, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? See, we can begin by the Spirit through justification. And then we can think that now when it comes to sanctification, God is expecting me to carry out the commandments in my own power and in my own strength. And Paul looks at the Galatians and he says, you're foolish, you've been bewitched. You're not supposed to now, after you have been justified and saved, to try to now in your own strength and power carry out these commandments by your own self-exertion. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now trying to be perfected, fully sanctified by your flesh? And see, you know, we've talked a lot, we talk a lot in, in our church about the need to be made ready. The bride makes herself ready. The, the, the bride makes herself ready, and to her it was given fine linen, white and clean, which are the righteous acts of the saints. There is this need for the bride to make herself ready to work out her salvation with fear and with trembling, but it's not a working out by the flesh. You can so easily get into working by the flesh and trying to be made ready instead of living and doing it from the life of God inside. I've seen it. Over the years, when, the, when God says, make yourself ready, make yourself ready, so many people turn their attention to what I need to do instead of realizing, no, is how I need to live. And I mean by his life. Now, there are things we will do, for sure. There are things we will do, but first it comes out of this abiding relationship with Jesus Christ that he then empowers you to do all the things he, you, he's asking you to do. So the Galatians were trying to be holy. The New Living Translation says it this way, How foolish can you be after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit? Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? And that Greek word that is for perfected, one of the definitions means is to take upon oneself. See, if we're not careful after we're justified, after we're born again, and we're not careful when the command comes, make yourself ready, overcome, is that we, th we can think that what God is saying to us is that we've got to take this on upon ourselves as our sole responsibility, not realizing, no, it is something the Lord carries with you. It is something the Lord empowers you by the Spirit of God to do. It's not in your own power. It's not in your own strength. And so, even today, many Christians today, many Christians today, in trying to live a holy life, which is very important, we all know that, trying to be made ready, they place right doing above right believing, achieving above receiving, and I mean receiving the Spirit and what Jesus has done for us, striving above abiding, behavior modification above a changed heart. God wants your obedience to come from a changed heart, not by external obedience. Again, external obedience is better than disobedience. The demands of external commandments above the Spirit's enablement. Personal responsibility above the Spirit's ability. Their works above Christ's finished work. And external righteousness above the Spirit's imparted righteousness. 
See, we've got to understand this. Only Jesus Christ is holy. Only Jesus Christ has overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. And only Jesus Christ pleases the Father. That means that only Christ in us, living, can overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Only Christ in us, living, can live a holy life. Only Christ in us, living, where we're allowing him to live and not us, can please the Father. See, this is so important. If we want to be people that please God, that please him, that live a holy life, that live in purity, we cannot do it in our own strength and power. Because what God is after is obedience from a changed heart, not external compliance, not behavior modification, not just trying to live up to the standard externally, but obedience that comes from a changed heart that wants to obey every commandment that God commands us in the new covenant from the heart in thought, motive, and deed. Make sense? I remember when I was preparing to write this class, The Indwelling Life, write the book, The Indwelling Life, is I was going through, okay, every single thing I found or heard, you know, I was in this preparation mode, everything I found or heard about indwelling life, I was making notes of and recording and trying to say, okay, yeah, I need to, take, I need to talk about this, I need to talk about that, I need to talk about this, I need to talk about that. And so I was asking the Lord also, okay, Lord, train, just like we were singing today, okay, Lord, train me how to live or, or train us, Holy Spirit, how to live. Train us, Holy Spirit. Train us, Holy Spirit. I was really praying, train me how to live the indwelling life, Lord. Because I don't want to, I'm writing this book, I at least need to, I mean, I've, I've been on this journey for a while, but I at least needed to, like, really, okay, Lord, train me. This is something you never graduate from. By the way, this, this teaching is something you never, you never move on from, okay? So we're going to go, I'm sure, in, next, in the fall, whenever we get through with this, we'll move on to another teaching. You never graduate from this. This is something, this is the core of Christianity. This is the core of what it means to live as a Christian. So you never move on from this. Everything revolves around this. You never graduate from this. The learning never stops. You will forever be going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into this. The depths are unending. But I was praying about this, and I was like, okay, Lord, how do I live by your life? And the Lord kindly rebuked me one more. I'm going to read what he, he shared. He said, Brian, you are trying to accumulate knowledge about how to live by my indwelling life so you can take that knowledge and apply it independently of me. How many of you have ever done that? <laughs> okay. You want to get the knowledge, and then you want to take that knowledge and go, I'm going to go apply it. See, a lot of the, the sermons being preached today are like 10 steps to this, 10 steps to that, how to do this, how to do that. Now, I'm not saying there's not a place for that. There is. But a lot of times those messages those 10 steps, okay, this is what, how you need to practically apply it. It always comes down to what you need to do. You take the knowledge and you apply it. Now, I think there is a place to take that knowledge and apply it as the Spirit lives through you. But what happens is we take that knowledge and we apply it by our own strength. You see what I'm saying? You are trying to live by my indwelling life from a set of principles you know rather than coming to me in you. How many times do we do that? Okay, we know this command. Even, even when, when, you know, I'm sure, even in teaching, I'm sure you always go, oh, I know that. Oh, I know that. Oh, I know that. That's showing us how embedded this tree of the knowledge of good and evil is in us. It's not enough to know it. It's, is, is Christ in us living up to the standard that he's expecting? Living by my indwelling life begins and ends with you coming to me in you and allowing me to live rather than you. 
See, when, when the Lord was speaking this to me, if you've ever, you know, I'm sure we've all, a lot of us have received words from the Lord in our own time with the Lord. Is as the Lord was speaking this to me, it was at the same time showing me how deep the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is embedded into my soul. How much I want to take knowledge of something I know and go apply it in my own soul, in my own strength, in my own self-effort. Rather than coming to the Lord in me and allowing him to live in me and through me and then applying it by the power of God that he gives us. See the difference? It's a, it's, a, it's a slight difference, but it makes all the difference in the world. Is that we would just go off and run off independently and say, okay, thank you, Lord, for saving me. I am now going to go do this. It just shows us how much this tree, that the fruit from this tree is embedded into our soul's DNA. And, and every one of us, every, even those who are not Christian, are still living by the principle of right and wrong. I'm saying... If your mind's processing, this is something that you probably have to listen to this message over and over and over to really get. It's much deeper than you think. That's why we need the Lord's revelation to reveal to us, okay, Lord, this is much deeper than I realize. We're only at the layer one of peeling the onion. God wants to go to like layer 30, peel, 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 to get the very life that we would live by his life. And so with that in mind, I want to talk about just kind of talk about what tree are you living from? What tree are you living from? And so I want to unpack this by, when you look at in Genesis 3, 5, we don't have to turn there, but when you look at Genesis 3, 5, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a temptation for Adam and Eve to try to be like God, knowing good and evil apart from God. In other words, that knowledge gave them the knowledge of what's good and right and what's evil and wrong and their soul being puffed up, yourself will be as God's. The soul becoming the life source you live by which feeds on knowledge to do in your own strength what's good and right and to avoid in your own strength what's evil and wrong. And based on if you're, if you're a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, a humanist, whatever, Based on what you are, your moral code is defined by those things. So even as a Christian, you can live the new covenant life like an old covenant Jew, taking the principles of the New Testament, good and evil, and living by those principles in your own self-effort and independent strength. Does that make sense? Again, this is something you gotta, you got to really... You, you, you got to really chew on this. It's, it's a lot deeper than we think. What I'm saying is there is a complete rewiring that needs to take place. I was thinking about this on the way to church today. It's like this. Let's imagine a, a man in his late 50s just has a heart attack. And he, you know, he, he survives the heart attack, but he's re realized my whole life I've been eating terrible. I eat fast food. I eat... Greasy food. I, I don't eat fruits and vegetables. I, I, I just basically just, it's all completely fast food. I don't exercise. You know, I don't do the things I need to do to, to take care of myself. And he has a heart attack. He survives, but he survives that life. And he realizes, if I want to continue to live much longer, I've got to change dramatically the way I live. I've got to eat healthy. I've got to eat fruits and vegetables. I need to have, I need to watch what I put into my body. I need to have a life of regular exercise. I need to eat good and exercise. But, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, a complete change of lifestyle. That's not easy when you've been doing it for 50 years. And so my bringing this into today is we have been living, even as Christians, by the tree of life, by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for so many years it's like changing that kind of lifestyle. It's a complete and thorough rewiring. You're not going to get it just in a one-hour message. You've got to press into this to ask the Lord to show you. I would encourage you to read this chapter, chapter 14 in Indwelling Life, over and over and over in a spirit of prayer, saying, okay, Lord, you teach me, you teach me. I'm telling you, it is deep. 
it goes much deeper than we realize. I had no idea, when, until the Lord showed me that, I had no idea how deep that was in my soul, that independence, that self-reliance. And it's still there. I'm still being rewired. But I, I just want to explain now, okay, what does it mean to live by the tree of knowledge? Watchman Nee called this living by the principle of right and wrong. And so just to, just to go through this, is living by the tree of knowledge is fueled by mental knowledge. Okay, that doesn't mean we don't need mental knowledge. Okay, this is talking about how you live. Okay, we need knowledge to survive in this society, to survive in life. Even as a Christian, we need knowledge to, of the word of God and all that. So, but it's living by or fueled by mental knowledge. It's driven by knowing what is good and right, evil and wrong. It is, it is independent, self-reliant living. It is doing what you know is good and right by your own independent self-effort. It's avoiding what you know is evil and wrong by your own independent self-effort. It's feeling self-righteous when you do good and avoid evil. It's feeling guilt, shame, and condemnation when you don't do right and avoid, and avoid evil. See, how many of you realize, okay, this is defining my life. <laughs> this is defining my life. Is, let's just apply it to every single person alive lives by this principle of right and wrong. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Muslim, a humanist, a Christian. We live by this principle of right and wrong. For the Jew, the 613 commandments of the Torah tell you, you must and you shall. And so the Jew lives by those commandments, by every force of strength they have to try in their best ability and self-effort to obey what they know is right and what they th know is wrong, to, to not obey what, or not to do what they know is wrong. For the Muslim, the Quran defines for them the five pillars of their faith. Do these things because you know these are right. Avoid these things because you know these are evil. For the humanists, the the spirit of the age, and we're seeing this in our culture, the spirit of the age defines what is right and what is wrong in the eyes of culture. Love is love. And so, you know, truth is relative. And so what is right in someone's eyes is what their moral code is. If the culture defines this is okay for you to do, love is love. Who am I to judge what someone else defines as love? And so, they do what they say is love and they avoid those things that they say is not love and then they judge as bigots those who do not define their moral code. We're seeing this right now in our culture with the whole LGBTQ agenda that's going crazy in our nation. That's all rooted in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The principle of right and the principle of wrong. But applying this now to us as Christians is we can get into legalism because we're living by the principle of right and wrong. The New Testament says these things are good, these things are evil, therefore what we're going to do is we're going to use our best effort and energy to do those things that are good, to avoid those things that are evil. Now, of course, this does not, does not mean we don't need to obey God. We absolutely need to obey God. But we're obeying Him from a different life source, of self rather than Christ. This making sense? Yeah. Hopefully it's opening your eyes to see how much, this is in, how much this has come into the Christian life. So many Christians are living the new covenant life like an old covenant Jew. I mean, a lot of the commandments in the old covenant are carried over into the new covenant. And they take the new covenant commandments and they say, this is what's right, this is what's wrong, this is what's good, this is what's evil. And they exert their energy and effort to obey that, not relying on Christ as their life source to live and do it through them. And when they hit the mark, they feel self-righteous. And they judge everyone who doesn't hit that mark. And when they don't hit that mark, they're overwhelmed with guilt, shame, and condemnation. See, God wants to go to the root of independence. How deeply independence runs in our, in our soul. 
How deeply, that's, that's what I hope God reveals to us, how deeply independent living runs in our soul. That we can just live this life in our own strength, in our own power, self-reliance. God, would you show us these things? So even as a Christian, we can get into Christian legalism. This all brings it to this. Here, back to Romans 5.10. Is now, how, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved, shall we be, de be delivered from his life, by his life? Here's my paraphrase. Is living by the indwelling life delivers us from the source of sin, which is our flesh, and the way of living embedded into the human psyche by the tree of knowledge. Here's your homework assignment is ask the Lord to reveal to you how much this tree of the knowledge of good and evil is at work in your own soul. That's your homework assignment. Spend some time in prayer. I'm serious. Wrestling through this, wrestling through this. Lord, show me, show me how deeply this is embedded in my own soul. How much this is so deeply embedded in my own soul. Lord, show me this so I can be delivered. Because God, want, the Lord wants to deliver us from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is so deeply embedded into us, and bring us into this new way of living, which is living by the tree of life, which is living by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to, let's read Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, and just, just think about this as we read this, as the Lord is speaking this is here is the tree of life incarnate. The tree of life incarnate. Speaking to a people who have tried to live by the law for centuries. And the tree of life incarnate is inviting them to now exchange living by the law, living by the external commandments, to now living by his life. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me. All, and, and so in the context, in, in our day in life, we don't come to him in heaven. We come to him in us. He's in us. We come to him by turning inwardly where he is, in us, in our spirit. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So many people read this scripture and they read it wrong. They think God is offer, the Lord is offering us rest from a busy week of working and parenting and from life being hectic. It doesn't mean you can't apply that to that condition, but the Lord's not speaking about, okay, you've had a long week, come to me and I'm going to give you peace and I'm going to give you rest. That's not what the Lord's saying. He's talking about two different yokes you carry. The yoke of the law, which in Acts 15, Peter said, are we going to place another yoke upon them that our fathers and forefathers and us, we could even bear this ourselves? So there's the one yoke where you carry the burdens of God's expectations and commandments yourself, and you exert your soul power to obey those commandments in your own independence and self-effort and strength. Or you take the yoke of Jesus that he's offering, which is light and easy, and come up under his yoke with him in a relational dependence with him and find rest for your soul. Rest for your soul in this context is not talking about having inner, inner peace, though the fruit of that is certain. You will have inner peace that way. It's not talking about coming and, you know, finding peace, finding rest. It's talking about changing the way you live. Jesus is talking to the Jewish people who have lived for centuries trying to live the, by the commandments, the external commandments of God, 613 commandments, trying to live by their soul, exerting all of their strength and effort to obey these commandments and these expectations. 
And the Lord is saying, your soul is weary from trying to obey God. You see, he's offering us soul rest and exchange life where we are no longer living from self-life in our soul, self being the source of life, to being him in you being the source of life. It's a beautiful, beautiful exhortation or, or invitation the Lord gives us. I would encourage you to read Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30 with this context. You, we probably have all read it like it's been preached for so long. Okay, you've had a busy week. You're tired. You're weary. You just need to come and experience the refreshing presence of God. Yes, that's all true, but that's not really what Jesus is saying here. He's inviting us even in the context of this message, exchange the way you are living by living by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to begin to live by the tree of life. Take my yoke upon you, come into relational dependence upon me. See, when, we're, when we take the Lord's yoke, he's carrying that yoke with us. And so the yoke is, some people think, some people, I've heard this before, some people think the yoke is like the yoke of an egg. No, it's the yoke that, that oxen would get under, two ox would get under this yoke, and they would, they would work side by side, and it would increase the production of the work dramatically. It would be, it's called synergism. It's like two ox working together, synergism. That's what the Lord's inviting you into, this interdependent relational intimacy with him. When you come under his yoke, which is light and easy. And John said that his commandments are not burdensome. Well, how can you explain that when you read the Sermon on the Mount? That sounds really burdensome. I mean, if you've ever read the Sermon on the Mount and said, okay, I'm going to try to live this, I mean, you can't do it. So John, I believe, in talking about that in 1 John 5, his commandments are not burdensome. I think John is telling us He's, he's, he's alluding, I think, back to what Jesus, his invitation is, you can live by his life. And as you live by his life, his commandments are not burdensome. You can do it by his power and by his strength. See, so the Lord is inviting us to an entirely new way to live. Rest for the soul into a deeper place of obedience. In Matthew 5.20, the Lord said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. We don't understand this the scribes and the Pharisees had strict obedience to the Torah. And I believe the Lord's not talking about the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. I don't believe, and I'm not going to explain it here because it would take too long. I don't believe entering the kingdom of heaven here is talking about personal salvation because that would teach salvation by works. I believe it's something else. So I'll get to that in later in another teaching. But just for this, the Lord, as, as his expectation upon his saved disciples, expects a righteous living that's greater than the scribes and the Pharisees who obeyed externally the 613 commandments of the Torah. Okay? That is what Jesus expects of us. A righteousness that comes from the heart that is much deeper than the external obedience of the Pharisees and the scribes, who though they did not commit murder, they had hate in their heart. That though they did not commit adultery, they looked on women to lust. And so God is calling us to this inward righteousness of living, a depth of obedience that is greater than the scribes and the Pharisees. It cannot happen by you carrying the, this yoke on your own shoulders. You will never 
ever be able to do it. You will never, ever be able to live the Sermon on the Mount lifestyle, which is for all of his disciples to live in your own strength and power. There is a depth of obedience God wants. There's a depth of obedience God wants. See, when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I'm humble in heart, when he was offering you the exchange life, he was, ex he was turning over the tables of old co covenant living. Old covenant living was going away. All the you must and you shalls by your own strength and power, it was going away and a new way of living was coming. But sadly, many Christians still live the new covenant, live in the new covenant like an old covenant Jew, trying to obey God in their own strength and their own power, not carrying the Lord's yoke and not having rest for their soul. Jesus inaugurated a new way of obedience centered upon an internal life-based dependency upon him through which, through your relationship with the indwelling spirit. See here, catch this. Obedience under grace is not only concerned with how you obey, what life source you obey from, but the depth at which you obey. See, when the Lord says, when the Lord says, take my yoke upon you, you're seeing this beautiful illustration of the synergism in obedience. The Lord's part and your part. See, under the law, the only one under the yoke was you. You had to do what God said to do with that yoke on your shoulders. Now the Lord says, there's two ox, me and you. Put, those, put, the, put that burden, put that yoke upon, uh, come under my yoke. Walk with me in a, a relationship of life. And that heavy burden you felt is going to become easy and light. The synergism of obedience. God's part, your part. God's role, your role. Both of those come to the fullest. That's what he's offering us here is this day and age of this heavy burden of commandments, of gritting our teeth through self-effort and religious grit, trying to obey God, trying to pray enough, trying to fast enough, trying to read enough, trying to witness enough, trying to go on enough mission trips, trying to do all these things for God are now over, come under his yoke, walk with him, and he gives you the power to do what he's calling you to do and to, and to be who he's calling you to be. See, if you're tired, if religion has worn you out, if religion has worn you out, if you're tired of the heavy burden you're carrying of trying to always perform up to some standard God is calling you to perform up to, if, you're, if that has worn you out, if you're weary from striving and struggling in your own strength to be good and do good, if you're exhausted from all your uh, effort to do right and avoid evil, God, the Lord Jesus himself, is offering you his yoke. The good news is, is you can lay down performance Christianity and you can take on his yoke. Live by his life and obey what God is calling you to do. And when you do this, the Lord himself says, learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. You will come into what T. Austin Sparks called the school of Christ, where you learn of Jesus Christ, not about him, but you learn him. You know him. The Lord wants us to move beyond head knowledge into experiential knowledge that comes by the Spirit of God. 
not by knowing facts about Jesus, but by knowing him intimately. And so I'll close this message here by saying this. Are you ready to go deeper into this new way of living? And if you are, here's your homework assignment. The 10 steps you need to go out and do. Just kidding. (laughs) Your homework assignment is, Lord, show me how much I still live by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, because what I'm talking about here, the Lord has to show you this. I can only speak this like I'm doing, but what I'm trying to communicate and what the Lord wants to do in you is so, there's so much deeper and it takes the Holy Spirit for him to show you what the depth of which this is talking about. Is your homework assignment is, Lord, show me how much I'm living by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Lord, train me to live by your life. Train me to live by your life. That's your two assignments right there, one and two. Lord, show me how much I'm still living by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Train me to live by your life. Number three, third homework assignment. I add one more. Read chapter 14 and ask the Lord to show you, show you, show you how deeply this goes because it goes deeper than you think, deeper than I think, that we might be saved by his life. Amen, amen. Father, we just come to you right now and Lord, we are thankful. God, we are thankful for the incredible invitation you are giving us. Lord, how beautiful it is, Lord, that you are giving us this invitation to take your yoke upon us, Lord, and to, and to, Lord, live by your life and that relational dependence upon you, to live by your life, Lord, that we would no longer live independently. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, even as, as I shared those homework assignments, Lord, I pray for every single person who is, li- who is uh, listening online and watching in person, every single person that you would give a real revelation, Lord, of how much we still live by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Lord, it's something you've got to show us. And I'm asking you, Lord, to show us by revelation how much we are still living by that tree, how much that, those, that principle of right and wrong is governing the way we live. I'm asking you to unearth that, to reveal it to us, Lord, to deliver us, Lord, thoroughly from that and to bring us into your life. Just where you're at, if if you want that process, you, you probably have been on this journey for some time, but if you want that process intensified and strengthened and God to bring you deeper. Just stand up right where you're at. If, if, you don't, if you're not there, don't stand up. Only if you're really, and it's okay if you don't stand up. But just hold your hands up to the Lord. Father, I just pray right now, Lord, that you would, you see every heart, Lord, and I have my hands raised as well. Lord, would you, bring to us a much deeper revelation, a light shining into the darkness of our hearts, Lord. Lord, would you come and would you, Lord, remove the fog that hovers over our minds? Lord, would light, would you allow your light to penetrate? Where you said, let there be light, and there was light. Lord, would you remove the brain fog? Lord, would you remove, God, the, Lord, the, uh, j- just even, maybe even not understanding the depth at which this applies? And would you take every one of us back to see that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and how we have not, the finished work of the cross does not, sanctification has not yet fully delivered us from that, effects of that tree. It's still embedded in our soul and our body. That way of living, 
Lord, would you reveal to us, God, how deeply that is? Would you allow the light of revelation to shine? Lord, you're the best teacher. Just ask the Lord right now to teach you. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. The Holy Spirit is the anointing who teaches you all things. We're asking you, Lord, right now, let the Holy Spirit, the anointing, teach us, Lord, about these two trees. And I pray that we would make a lifestyle change, just like the man who has to change his lifestyle from eating bad and not exercising to eating healthy and exercising. That lifestyle change that's required, that entire rewiring of life that's required, Lord, to live by your life in that relational dependency upon you. I'm asking you, Lord, that you would show everyone with their hands raised in their own unique way, Lord, how to do that. Lord, how train them and equip them on what, Lord, take all that I've talked about in this message and train them, equip them to know what that means, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Just with your hands raised, we're going to end the online portion right now, but just stay, if you're in person, stay with your hands raised and...